This is Watkins. Welcome with Bridget Fetisy. I'm Bridget Fetisy, and you are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> You know the drill. Please subscribe, rate, comment, share, reach out, tell your friends, send smoke signals, whatever. We love your feedback and we want to hear from you. This week, our sponsor is M.M. Lafleur. M.M. Lafleur is a wardrobe solution for professional women. It creates luxury apparel and accessories with the same attention to detail as high-end fashion houses. Right now, if you visit mmlafleur.com slash walkin and use promo code walkin, you'll get 15% off your first purchase. That's mmlafleur.com slash walkin and you can get 15% off your first purchase with promo code walkin. National election since 1988. Most recently, he authored the book How to Beat Trump, America's Top Political Strategist on What It Will Take. Before that, he was a creator, executive producer, and co-host of Showtime's political documentary series, The Circus. Some of our conversation might seem a bit dated because we recorded this previously, and I was holding on to it for Super Tuesday, since he's talking about what the Democrats should do in order to win 2020 election. So... It's really interesting given what's happening to hear what his advice is. So enjoy. I'm with Mark Halperin, everyone. I'm excited. Good day. Good day. <laughs> Let's just get right into it since it's on, on the, we're on the other side of the impeachment. How you wrote the book, How to Beat Trump. Do you think that he's beatable? It's going to be very difficult. I wrote the book because I was talking to Democrats for the last three years who said, people better be taking this seriously. He's going to get reelected unless we do something. Basically for two reasons. One is incumbents generally win. We've had three straight two-term incumbents, only four elected incumbents have lost since 1900. But also, Donald Trump is a beast of a candidate, Mm -hmm. and he has a four-year head start we have no idea who the Democratic, uh, Democrats are going to nominate, but every one of them is vulnerable to the things that make Trump a strong candidate. So this isn't a book advocating Trump be beaten. It's not a book advocating Trump win. It's a book talking about what smart Democrats think need to be done to beat him. And everyone I interviewed for the book, with one exception, was extremely skeptical that Trump could be beaten. I don't know, even looking at all of the people who are in the race, I can't see any of them beating him. Well... I mean, I don't write about specific candidates in the book. I yeah. write about about what it would take to beat him. Um, it's going to be difficult. I mean, there's lots of reasons. One is the party is really divided. Yes. You've got establishment candidates like Joe Biden, Pete Buttigieg, and, and, and Michael Bloomberg, and Amy Klobuchar. And then you've got Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. Mm. And there doesn't seem to me to be a trajectory where... One one camp will win the nomination, and the other side will say, "Oh, that's okay with us." If it's an establishment candidate, I think the Warner and Sanders people will be very upset. If Warren and Sanders win, I think you're going to see a lot of Democrats say, "Just can't support someone who supports some of the really far left things they support." I don't think people understand how independents actually work, and I have a Patreon level where I talk to um, different people, and. F- I have 25 people at that level and we usually end up talking about politics and 20 of them are in individual different states, many of them swing states. And because I identify very publicly as politically homeless, I self-selecting attract that crowd. But these are swing voters in swing states and they all say to me, if it was Tulsi or Yang, maybe I could vote for somebody like that. But if it's Warren or if it's Sanders, I'm voting for Trump. Yeah. I, I mean, don't think people understand this. They don't. You know, people think of independence as in the mushy middle. Yeah. In fact, many of them are unaligned and disaffected. And um, people look at Trump, the national polls, for instance, and say, well, Trump's really behind in the head to head. But the national polls don't matter. National polls, one in every seven people in the national polls from California. Right. It doesn't matter. What matters is Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, above all else. And in those states, older states, whiter states, Trump is strong, yeah, and and he hasn't even begun to fight. One of the things I, I mentioned in the book is a year ago, 
or so in December of of uh, of the year before Obama was running for re-election, mm-hmm. the New York Times Magazine said he had a 17% chance of getting re-elected. He obviously got overwhelmingly re-elected. Right. Incumbents used their power to get re-elected. And the Democratic Party, people say, well, people want someone who's electable and someone who can beat Trump above all else. But there's not a lot of agreement about who that is. No. The people I talked to for the book said, these are things that anybody can do, whether they're liberal or, or more centrist. But as you and I talked about before we started recording, there's almost no sign that any of these candidates are taking seriously what needs to be done. The primary thing is, you need to be thinking about how to beat Trump now, even as you're trying to win the nomination. Right. And they're so caught up in trying to win the nomination, understandably so on one level, right. but on another level, if you win the nomination and you're not prepared to turn right around and engage with Trump and have the money and the resources and the broad support within the Democratic Party, you're not going to win. I feel like I, there was that part in your book that talked about the electability versus the ideology. And I actually think the majority of probably center left Democrats and reasonable people care about electability, but the small minority cares about the ideology. And I actually don't think that the electability will win over that. In terms of who wins the nomination? Yeah, I I don't think that because I think that I actually don't think the party cares about electability. (laughs) Well, some do and some don't. But, you know, between them, Warren and Sanders have depending on what poll you look at, and we're talking about national polls or state polls, they, they're getting close to 50% support between them, uh, certainly uh, close to 40%. And if they team up, they'd probably become the nominees. And some of the positions they hold, so elimination of private health insurance, decriminalizing the border, mm-hmm. health insurance for people who are here illegally, massive tax increases. A lot of Democrats I talked to for the book said those positions alone, forget anything no. else about them, make them unelectable in yeah. places like Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Michigan. So you have to p- nominate someone who can win. And as you said, there are a lot of people in the party who want that ideology. They want a dramatic change from Trump. And if someone like a Joe Biden or a Pete Buttigieg wins the nomination, they're not going to be happy. And it's going to be very difficult to get them out to vote. I had somebody say to me yesterday, and it struck me, he's someone who came from the right and was a conservative, but got pushed more center because he finds Trump to be abhorrent just as a person. Mm -hmm but is okay with some of his policies being a conservative. And he said yesterday, I don't know how I want this to turn out, which I found really interesting because I actually think it was so striking to me. I think a lot of people feel that way who might be in the center. I don't really know. He, the idea of a Warren or Sanders for him is no incomprehensible, but he didn't vote for Trump in the last election and can't bring himself to vote for him. Now we're in California, so it doesn't really matter, but on principle, he just can't vote for him. Yeah. I mean, the people I interviewed for the book said that if, if the party nominates certain people, again, the book's not about the, the candidates, it's about how to beat Trump for any candidate, but they're, they're worried about that kind of person. Mm. They're worried that, that people look at the polls and say, well, Trump's approval rating is only 43%. How could he possibly win? There are people who didn't vote for Trump last time who will vote for him this time. Right. Almost every Democrat I talked to said more people will vote for Trump this time. He's going to get more people because he's had a head start. He's got more sophisticated use of Facebook to find people. And he knows he needs more voters than he did last time to win. So it's going to be a real challenge. And the person like you described, I talk to people like that all the time mm. who's, who can't imagine voting for Trump. But then when they say, well, if it's the race, it's really going to be between Trump and Warren or Trump and Sanders, or for some of them between Trump and Buttigieg, or even some of them between Trump and Biden, they say, you know what? I'll take four more years of this. Right. I think it was interesting. I was talking to somebody in Florida, one of my patrons and is a swing voter who couldn't vote for Trump, but I've been calling it the chicken little syndrome. He said he will be voting for Trump because so many people said that the economy was going to crash and we'd be in World War III and there were all these horrible things. And I think people underestimate that number of people who were scared of voting for Trump and now that things aren't that bad and given, I mean, we're still a year out, but if things stay pretty much the same, there will be this huge surplus of people who 
think he's doing a pretty okay job. There's peace and prosperity. And if you like the kind of judges that he nominates, Mm -hmm. you know, not everyone's benefiting from this economy, but we have record low unemployment. Mm -hmm. Uh, The GDP growth is big. He's struck now uh, two trade deals that he promised to strike, which could really help the economy. So he has things to talk about. And people, some people who say, well, Trump can be beaten. They say, well, given all that, he's not that popular. We can beat him. The reality is, once he starts talking, not just about his record, but starts going after the Democrat with tens of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars, it's going to be very, very challenging to beat him. And as I said, incumbents tend to win. Right. And Trump is a strange bird, but he's still an incumbent. And he understands, and his team understands the benefits of incumbency and how to use it. He seems, I, I knew he was going to win. I always, I was one of the rare people that I, I wish- How'd you know? I said on Twitter, and I wish I still had these, I deleted everything after Parkland. Um, I said, Kim Kardashian made $75 million last year. Trump will be our next president. I just never doubted once he entered the race and the level of attention that everybody, this is why I think Tulsi actually is a genius because she knows how to get attention. And this is, I mean, the Kardashians, proved this to me too it doesn't matter if you have substance all that matters is if you have eyeballs politics is a lot about eyeballs and and one of the things i explore in the book is what makes somebody so compelling you Mm. know trump is like he's an incredible performer he's an incredible television producer obviously people read his tweets even people who hate him they can't look away you look at this democratic field some of them have a lot of following on social media but they can't command the stage the way he does no. and to beat him you're going to have to be able to do that one of the things that that people i interviewed for the book are really disappointed about is these candidates are not engaging with trump very often they're not finding a way to get under his skin mm-hmm. they're not practicing what it's going to be like to go against him mm-hmm. and if they if the nomination whether it's decided in march or not till the convention in july eventually you're going to every day have to deal with Trump. Yep. And as somebody told me for the book, they said, they said, Trump doesn't dominate the news. He is the news. Yes. Just like the Kardashians. It's not a normal, it's not a, a symmetrical fight. It's an asymmetrical fight. And so figuring out how to, how to go after someone who dominates the news. And again, it's one thing to dominate the news when you're, when you're we're running for an open seat. As the incumbent president, he could he could announce a military yep. action. He could announce uh, something on immigration. He could announce <laughs> something on economics. And it must be covered because he's the president of the United States. So yes. it's a very daunting prospect. And and I'll say again, I know he can be beaten, but it's going to take a much stronger effort than any of these candidates are showing so far. I don't think anyone has, like you said, the personality, though. That's yeah. what, I, what I see is one of the things I noticed in 2015 and 2016 leading up to the election, despite saying that they didn't want Trump to win. If from just a visual perspective, you scroll down CNN's Twitter feed, it was Trump, picture of Trump, picture of Trump, picture of Trump, picture of Hillary, picture of Trump, picture of Trump, picture of Trump, picture of Trump, Trump, the whole thing. So even if you're talking about how you don't want him to be president, you certainly are signaling, you're giving him a lot of free media a lot of um, all that imagery matters people see that and they just think trump yep and if you're in the liberal media bubble if you're watching msnbc or you're watching cnn which is in some ways has become more anti-trump than msnbc you think trump can't win because what you watch is 24 hours a day of coverage about he's being impeached there's this controversy there's that controversy there's this resignation uh they're focusing on the negative aspects of the economy that is helping trump win for yep. two reasons. One is it's making Democrats complacent. And the other is it is making Trump supporters furious because they don't think he's covered fairly. Right. So I think in, if Trump is reelected, there'll be a lot of reasons, including mm-hmm. probably the weakness of whoever the Democrats nominate. But I really do put in the top three, the, the ironically, the, 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 the biased press who really don't like Trump at all, won't give him credit for anything. Their negative coverage of him will really help him win. Yes. And also, like you very astutely noted in your book, they seem to have a dysfunctional love-hate relationship with him. And I can't remember the exact line, but you basically said you don't, just because you don't love someone doesn't mean you don't desire them. Right. And that is... They they love him in a weird way. They've never been more popular. They they cannot quit him. No. He is great for business. And... You know, you look at 
the prospect of the first female president, the first Jewish president, the first openly gay president. That should be, those should all be exciting things mm-hmm. that the, the liberal press in particular should be should be enthused about. But when Trump does his thing, the press, a lot of the people in the press corps just stand there with their mouths open and 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 look at it and wonder and it really does help him and yep. his and his supporters love it politics should not be show business but a lot of it is and it always has been yes. and you've got to be able to compete on that level and i'll say again democrats who go around saying as you said people said well he's going to get us into wars he's going to destroy the economy you have to acknowledge those things haven't happened. And right. you have to acknowledge, I think probably the chapter in the book I'm most proud of is, you have to acknowledge that the, almost half the country voted for him mm-hmm. and almost half the country still supports him mm-hmm. and they really support him. Yep. And they're not unpatriotic. They're not stupid. They're they're people who, and they're not all racists. There are a lot of, a lot of people in this country who just like him as president. And if you're going to beat him, you have to accept those people. You have to try to win them over. You're not going to win a lot of them over, but you have to be running to be their president too and a lot of the democrats just can't bring themselves to do that no i've always said the idea of trump derangement syndrome works in both ways it's the people who blame everything on trump and he lives in their head rent free and it's insane and then on the right it's the people who he can do no wrong and he's their savior and i've run into them often online but it does seem to have there are two strains of it: the resistance and the MAGA of Trump yeah. derangement syndrome. Yeah. And look, the the last three presidents caused some of that. There were, Bill Clinton inspired strong feelings of support and against George Bush did, Barack Obama did. But this is a this is a whole different level. I've met a lot of people in my life uh, as a journalist covering politics and sports and entertainment. There's really no one like Trump. Yeah. There's just when when before he ran for president on a few occasions, I was out in public with him. People react to him. It's beyond the way they react. I know. Beyond the way they react to, to, you know, Jennifer Lopez or Beyonce or Michael Jordan. People are just, there's something about him that people really react to. And as you said, some very positive, some very negative, but it's a, it's a force that if you're going to beat him, you have to understand it and you have to learn how to deal with it. You're not going to out Trump Trump, no. but you have to figure out, you have to have a theory of the case of how do I beat a guy who is such an object of, of fascination? Yeah, you have to become an object of fascination yourself. In your, I don't, in your own way. Yeah, you do, you, you do for sure. I don't, one of the things that you were saying <clears throat> in the book and that I kind of, I wonder about only because there was this idea that a lot of the strategists were saying that it needs to be somebody, people might be worn out from the chaos. Mm-hmm. And again, I say, yeah, they might be, but I grew up in a very chaotic environment and even though I was worn out by it, I started, you. your brain starts craving it yep. and you start creating it. So I don't know that even if people are worn out from it, I'm like, oh, what are you going to do? When Trump goes quiet for two days, you can feel the journalists right. and everyone getting twitchy. Right. They're, they want that yep. fix. Yep. There's no doubt that that's, that's part of the dynamic. I interviewed over 75 Democrats for the book. The, a minority of them said the way you beat Trump is by saying we're exhausted, we need a change, we need a different kind of person. That's sort of what Hillary Clinton ran against. It didn't work. The majority of them, and and most of the topics people agreed on, but there was disagreement here, but the majority of them said the way you beat him is by convincing people that his policies really aren't helping them, that they're helping the wealthy, that they're helping corporations. And that's a challenge to do. You've got to find real people who are out there talking about maybe people who voted for Obama twice and then Trump right. who now are against Trump. You got to find them. You got to vet them. You got to figure out who's good on television. One group uh, trying to beat Trump, a, a Democratic leaning group, did an ad with a guy from Pennsylvania who claimed in the ad that he'd voted for Trump and now he turned against him. And then the local paper went and looked. He didn't vote for Trump. In fact, he's never voted. Oh, God. So you've got to find yeah. real, real people <laughs> and you got to vet them. And again, that takes time. Yeah. And what, what the people I interviewed for the book said is every one of these campaigns should be finding these people now. There are a lot of veterans, too, that I feel like mm-hmm. would be good for this. Yep. Ma- veterans, uh, people who work in, in coal business, mm-hmm. people who work, uh, people like the work in farming. farmers. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. In theory. But a cautionary point is all these liberal newspapers send reporters out to talk to manufacturing workers, talk to farmers. And most of the stories have people saying, I'm willing to give him more time. You know, he's right. dealing with a really messed up situation right. and and you know, I trust him to deal with this. And I don't I don't think that's going to change for a lot of people going into next year. So, you know, there're a lot of small sort of tactical things in the book that are important like on the nights of Iowa and New Hampshire, you need to make sure you're speaking to the whole country. But the one of the big broad things is 
you really have to tell a better American story than Mm. Trump tells. Trump tells an American story about our recent past and about what the future should be like that for a lot of people is dark. For a lot of people, it it leaves them out. For a lot of people, it's racist. But for a lot of people, enough for him to get elected once and and be the favorite to be reelected, it's really compelling. It, It speaks to their anxiety and it speaks to their hope. And if to beat Trump, you've got to tell a better story. It has to acknowledge the fact that people are worried. They don't think their kids are going to have the same economic opportunity they did. Mm -hmm. They don't think the country's headed in the right direction. They want someone to say, here's where we'll go. You pretty much know what, what life will be like if Donald Trump wins four more years. I follow it really closely. If Joe Biden's president or Elizabeth Warren or, or Pete Buttigieg, what's life in America going to be like? They haven't painted that sufficiently yet. I don't think any of them. And I think there's this, idea of better the devil you know so Mm -hmm. people who might be on the fence or torn or feeling there's a lot of cognitive dissonance that i think people are having to wrestle with and just the ideas that are being presented by particularly the far left Mm -hmm. are essentially abolish the constitution boys and girls aren't different these very extreme ideas and then you have trump who might be he might be a limited threat in theory, um, a lot of people would disagree with that. People will choose what they know. I think when they're faced with this uh, this uncertainty of oh, socialism and all what's being presented and something that's maybe bad but limited. Yeah, I mean, look, I think I think if you take the three categories of voters that Democrats are amongst them amongst the three categories amongst the many categories of voters Democrats are relying on. African American men, suburban women, and white working class voters. You can imagine all three of the people, members of all three of those groups saying, you know what? If it's Trump or a socialist, Trump is someone who will take my health insurance away. Mm-hmm. You know, I got a lot of problems with Trump, but I'll vote for Trump. And it doesn't take a lot for him to get reelected because the states he won last time, with the exception of Michigan, Pennsylvania, and, and Wisconsin, I don't saying he's got a lock on him, but but he's very strong in this and every other state he won last time. So the Democrats margin of error for beating him isn't very great. They got to win back all three of those states or they got to find some other place to win. I've always said the only person who can beat Trump is Trump. Like, I think that he 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 seems to be impenetrable and he can make whatever gaffe he wants to make. And you talk about a lot of this in the book that he's just resilient to these things that would normally tank any other politician. Even last night, there was a, the one where he went after the Michigan John Dingell. Uh-huh. Former congressman. Yeah. Congressman, yeah, and he's beloved in yeah. Michigan and went after the widow and uh, he um, implied that he was looking up at them from hell and uh, there was all of this outrage and I wonder if that will even matter. I mean, look, the guy won the Republican nomination attacking John McCain, Megyn yeah. Kelly, Fox News, uh, the Pope. He, 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 he has this ability to change the subject. You know, one of the things I did for the book was I talked to a lot of people who worked for Hillary Clinton. Mm. And some people said, well, why would you talk to them? Because they obviously didn't do a good job. Yeah, but well, they've learned, they've I would learned. think. They're the only ones who've had the chance to actually go up against him. And one, one person I talked to, a woman named Amanda Renteria, who was Hillary Clinton's uh, political director, she said... Most of these politicians who are running, and most of the people who are running are politicians, they're used to, before they say something, they'll say, well, what did I say last week about this? Or what does the lawyer say about this? Or what does my communications director say? Trump doesn't care about any of that. If you said to Trump, well, don't say that because you said the opposite last week, he doesn't care. So that's something you have to adjust to. That's something that if you're the Democratic nominee against Trump, you have to say, this is this is not like anybody I've ever run against. If I if Trump says something and I go out and I have a press conference and I say, well, ladies and gentlemen, last week he said the opposite. It, it doesn't, just doesn't stick yeah. to him. And he is the master of reading when to change the subject. Mm. He's the master of recovering from mistakes. Mm-hmm. You don't have to, again, I'm not a Trump supporter. I'm not a Trump detractor. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm for the American people. But as an analyst of Trump's abilities, he is the master of controlling what people talk about. Mm-hmm. And he's the master of changing the subject and knowing when to change the subject. Mm -hmm. A lot of politicians, they're on a roll, they keep going and they don't want to stop it because it's like, well, this has worked for me for the last three days. Let's keep doing it. Trump has this fingertip feel for when to change it. And again, even the press that doesn't like him falls prey to Trump's ability to control what's going on. Yeah, it's really wild. I was saying, imagine thinking 
the world revolves around you, perhaps being a narcissist, and then the world literally <laughs> does revolve around you. Were yeah. you wrong? <laughs> all of a sudden, all of a sudden, all the things he's always thought about himself, yeah, he's the are center true. of the universe. Now it's true. And and how do you stop someone? You can't. I mean, look, he hasn't gotten us into wars. People thought he might. Yeah. He hasn't wrecked the economy. People thought he might. And while the White House is just a total mess and, and the personnel situation is ridiculous and what he did on Ukraine is ridiculous, he is a one-man show. Mm. He has a few people around him and he just he makes decisions the way he makes decisions. And again, it's flawed and it's distasteful and, and worse for a lot of people, but it's not it's you know you said only Trump can be Trump. The way he's conducting himself, I don't think is going to. I don't think it's going to beat him. Yeah, I think I think it's really going to take, as they say in the book, it's going to take a Democrat figuring out how to li- make the case. Trump is the wrong choice, but he's. It's not going to be a referendum on Trump. That's no. the mistake a lot of Democrats make. They think people are going to vote him out because they don't like him. Well, no. When they start to focus on the the alternative, you mentioned a couple people already. I meet them all the time. People who say boy, I can't really imagine voting for Trump again. But then when you say, well, okay, what if it's this person? What if it's that person? Right. They say, well, I might not vote at all. I might vote for some other candidate. I might write in Mickey Mouse. Right. I might vote for Trump. But he is going to try to disqualify whoever the Democrat is. And again, that's what that's what Obama did to Romney. It's what Clinton did to Dole. It's what Bush did to John Kerry. It's very easy for a smart incumbent to take this Democrat or or a Republican who's the who's the challenger, and basically define them in negative terms, and that that is Trump's single greatest skill: yeah. defining other people on on his terms. I'd like to take a quick break so we can talk about our sponsor. MM Lafleur was founded on the idea that when women succeed in the workplace, the world becomes a better place. If you hate shopping for work clothes like me, I hate shopping for work clothes. Then MM is the perfect place to start. I discovered this company and love it. I went to the mmlafleur.com website. You can shop their website a la carte or browse their pre-style capsule wardrobes. And I need that kind of inspiration because I am not a fashionista. And as I mentioned, I hate shopping, but it's mostly just because I hate clothes. And MM Lafleur is great for somebody like me who just really cannot stand the entire process. Or you can go to one of their showrooms in seven cities across America where they'll actually help you. And I need all the help I can get. I also need clothes that are versatile and can go from media hits to lunches to podcast interviews. This is the kind of clothing that you can pretty much wear in any situation. I love their blazer that I got. I can wear it anywhere and I wear it obsessively and the quality is so good. It's durable and will last for a long time, which is important to me. Many styles are machine washable. A lot of them have an all natural anti odor treatment and it lets you wear your garment more in between washes, which is also amazing if you travel a lot and are on the road. And there are lots of little thoughtful design details like adjustable hems if you're changing between flats and heels, deep pockets, which is awesome when they include pockets for women. Shipping and returns are always free and you can email, chat, or text anytime with any styling questions. So, Visit mmlefleur.com slash walkin and use promo code walkin for 15% off your first purchase. That's mmlafleur.com slash walkin and you can get 15% off your first purchase with promo code walkin. So what made you, you said you wanted to write this book because there, there was a need for it, but do you think anyone will actually read it. <laughs> well, I mean, a lot of Democrats have read it. I know that the people around the president have read it. And the of course, the they've read it. The challenge is taking the advice that all these Democrats gave yeah. and, um, and, and executing it. Yeah, because it's very difficult in the heat of a presidential campaign. One reason why I had the book come out when it did was because I wanted to lay these out ideas out far enough in advance from Iowa and New Hampshire so people could think about it and to offer for Democrats looking for a candidate who can win, read the book and say, well, which one of the people running can actually potentially do some of this stuff? One reason why some Democrats are attracted to Michael Bloomberg, even though I don't think the party's in the mood to nominate a billionaire, yeah. is he at least 
is thinking about the general election. He's basically running a general election campaign already. I already his, see his ads on the his ads football. Are, his ads are already on yeah. television. He's running in states like North Carolina. He's running in states like Wisconsin mm-hmm, and Michigan. Mm-hmm. That That is is what's needed. Now, I don't think it's going to make it hard for him to get the nomination, but that is but that is that is missing from the efforts of the other people. Right. So I think I think I see every day or almost every day, I see things some of the Democratic candidates are doing that represent some of the advice the Democrats and I interviewed for the book gave. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it's because they've read the book or not, but they're but they're starting to try. Right. But it's but it's nothing like the full effort that people say is going to be required um, starting now and going into the spring and then the summer and then the fall. I feel like if they don't have somebody locked in by March, it's there. It, I don't even know how you would have enough time to pivot. And I feel like the party, if they do care about beating Trump, which I sometimes don't think they actually do, they should just unite and figure out who's yeah. going to run by March so that they can they can put all of their efforts into beating him I mean, instead of that'd giving be, it. That'd be rational. And, right. And it would be... It would be it would give that person many more months to get things together, but it may not break that way. We'll have to see what happens in the early contest. Like I said, there's this big cleavage between Sanders and Warren and everybody else. Yep. And I meet people who support Sanders and Warren all the time who say they're not interested in this election if it's not one of the two of them. Yeah. And without those people, that was part of Hillary Clinton's problem. Bernie Sanders endorsed her eventually, but her failure to get his supporters a lot of his supporters excited really cost them the race. So yeah, most everyone they were so mad. Yeah, most everyone. I mean, they were madder at Hillary Clinton than they were at Donald Trump. I know. And most everyone agrees with you that if somehow the process can produce a Democratic nominee early, that'd be better. But it it may not happen. And even if it does, it doesn't necessarily mean you emerge stronger. Right. You know. That's the biggest question, not so much when the person emerges, although as you suggested correctly, that's important. But the more important question, I think, is when there's a de facto Democratic nominee, is that person been strengthened by the process the way Barack Obama was when he beat Hillary Clinton? Or are they weakened by the process right. because they're they're battered by by Democrats who are challenging them on a range of issues <laughs> so from crazy. the left or the right? It's a real puzzle. It's, it's a real puzzle. And you think that the country went through, people on the left in this country went through a uh, incredibly traumatic experience when Trump got elected. If he is reelected, I, I, I really, I really do worry about the mental health of a lot of people in the country. I know it's crazy. I, I, I have, I do comedy, and one of my jokes is, "Did planes fly after Trump was won?" Because in big cities, it was like nine eleven. Right. And I'm like, did they allow planes to fly? Right. I can't remember. It was so quiet. Or right. it was like a, a city where when the snow falls and you can't hear anything. It was just deafening silence. And part of what has been interesting to observe, I was very clear-eyed about what was happening. And I can't, I went back east and talked to family members and friends, some of whom decided, I was surprised to find out we're voting for Trump. And I talked to them and these are people I love. And so I wasn't immediately like, you're a racist and an idiot. And I really started to understand why they were voting for this person. And I came back here and I ended up telling my friends i'm like we're missing something we are in a bubble we are missing something big and we have to pay attention and we can't just write all of these people off right and i lost friends for even suggesting that he might win not even being right about the fact that he would just suggesting that he had a chance at winning yeah you know i covered trump in more than 25 states uh in 2016 and i saw the people at the rallies i talked to them i understood what they cared about the, the, the central reality of the last 25 years in America is people are scared about the future. Right. They're scared about what their kids' opportunities will be. They're scared about the, the America's role in the world and about terrorism. They're, they're concerned about uh, Washington politicians and the status quo not being good enough to address the challenges we face. They want mm-hmm. things shaken up. Mm-hmm. Trump promised that. Hillary Clinton didn't. You know, I, I, I don't. I don't think Joe Biden is is necessarily the weakest general election candidate. When people say he's obviously the strongest, he is the status quo. He's been in you know, a, a Washington politician since the early 1970s, and to say that Trump can't take advantage of that, I think is wrong. I think he'll get Biden, crushed. Biden brings other strengths to it, but he brings a lot of weakness yeah, to it too, think- particularly on this issue. What Washington uh, has not addressed the needs of the American people, and Trump has addressed some of them. 
for some people. Yeah. It may be enough for him to win. And like I said, most people I talked to the, for the book made him either the favorite or the heavy favorite to get reelected. I don't know. I think I think Biden will get crushed. Well, who do you think would be the strongest? <laughs> Nobody. Yeah. But Biden, I just feel like he slip. His brain seems a little slippery. I, I'm I'm legitimately worried that yeah. he might be just slipping. Yeah. And there seem to be instances of that where I'm like, ah! and I think that even if there's that doubt, I see what they did to Hillary in terms of her health. Right. And I know that they'll just go so yeah. hard on him. Right. Basically yeah. probably having dementia, maybe right. al- yeah. allegedly. I mean, I think there's, there's four weakness, fundamental weaknesses. One is what you said, which is his the, son. Number two is son. First is, is the question of his, his own mental status. Two is his son. Three is what I mentioned before, a career politician. And then four is he does not excite young people. No. You know, there was an Iowa poll in which he was doing perfectly well overall, but he got 2% of voters under 45. <laughs> 2% of voters under I 45. That. And I don't think you're going to beat Donald Trump if you don't inspire young people. And it's weird because even though Donald Trump is young, um, old, he has a youthful w- feel about him. He's got energy and he's great on social media. Yeah. You know, I ask people all the time as like a, a test, and I don't really know the full answer. So in, 19, in 2016, Donald Trump and Marco Rubio both ran for president. Mm-hmm. Marco Rubio wanted every bit as much to dominate social media as Donald Trump did. No one cared about Marco Rubio's Twitter feed. Why not? Young, interesting, uh, Hispanic, and but nobody cared. It's hard to break through, you though. Know? Yeah, but Trump does. And as you, you have said, to kind of be a troll, though. Yeah. You have, to be I mean, willing to, you have to be willing to do things that a lot of people just aren't willing to do. But you got to do it in a way that works. Right. And sometimes people try and it just doesn't, it doesn't pay off. Trump is a great television producer. He's a great content provider. As I said, that shouldn't be what determines who's president, but it plays a big role. And I look at Elizabeth Warren. And I look at Bernie Sanders, Pete Buttigieg, Joe Biden, Amy Klobuchar, Michael Bloomberg. I don't see any of them being able to compete with Trump. I ask people all the time, forget who you'd like to be president, forget who you're going to vote for, who can beat Trump? And I don't hear a lot of people express any confidence about any of the field. People who said Biden a few months ago, based on what's transpired since the confrontation he recently had with an elderly man in Iowa <laughs> over, Bo, over Hunter Biden. I saw that, where he called him a fat. Yeah, uh, <laughs> challenged him to a push-up contest. Yeah. People looked at that one event and it really undermined their confidence that he'd be able to handle Trump. Because if he could be discombobulated by an Iowa voter, what happens when Trump comes after him yeah. every every day? Yeah. Every day. And Trump will talk all about his, all about, about uh, Hunter Biden. Yeah. And Hunter Biden's life is complicated, yes. I say euphemistically. Yes. There's a lot to look at, not just in terms of the, 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 the board he was on with the Ukrainian energy company, but he, he is, he is you know, he's he's been divorced and remarried. And is he the one with the baby mamas? He's got, apparently, there's a woman in Arkansas <laughs> yep. who said he fathered a child with her. He just recently married a woman he'd known for like five days. I think that he got ordered by court because she did a paternity test that it was, it is actually his child. That's, I think that's, a, that's the current claim yeah. by, by the woman. But Joe Biden loves his family. I'm really surprised he ran. And, and I, I am think, too. I think the history of Donald Trump, if he is reelected, Hillary Clinton running four years ago, Biden running this time whether he's the nominee or not, I think really played as big a role as anything in Trump winning. Because if Hillary Clinton hadn't run, if Joe Biden hadn't run, other people would have run. Mm. They wouldn't have deferred to them as so many people did. And I think other people could beat him who who, who were kept out of the race by Clinton, kept out of the race by Biden. That's interesting. Who do you think could beat him? Terry McAuliffe, who was governor of Virginia, mm-hmm. I don't think would be the least bit afraid of him. I mm-hmm. think he, he, I think he tells a great American story, a pretty successful governor in Virginia. Uh, that one person I think could beat him. I think, uh, I think Jerry Brown could beat him. Mm. I think John Kerry could beat him. Interesting. Uh, just, just to name a few people who I think could win. I don't know why Biden's running. I don't. I, I feel. I think I heard or read somewhere that Obama told him not to. <laughs> Obama, Obama didn't want him to run last time and talked him out of it and didn't want him to run this time. He's very skeptical that Biden can win the nomination and very skeptical he can win a general election. That's an interesting, you raise an interesting person, Barack Obama, Michelle Obama, Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer. Normally by this point in the cycle, one who's, fo- if you're following the race closely, you have a sense of who people are for. Mm. Can you tell me who Nancy Pelosi wants to be the nominee? No, I no. can't. I've been paying attention to this more than I ever yeah. have in my life. And what's, interesting is 
Barack Obama's silence. Mm-hmm. He's generally just been quiet. And I I don't know. People always want Michelle Obama to, to jump in. Right. And I do think somebody like Michelle Obama or Oprah. So my if someone asked me who could beat Trump, right. I would I basically say Oprah right. or Michelle Obama, someone who can inspire and has a big enough personality and already pre existing brand awareness. Yeah. Look, if if I were if I became the Democrat nominee, I would go to Michelle Obama and say, You need to be my running mate. I know right. you, I know you I know you don't want to run for public office, but we can win if you're my running mate. And if you're not my running mate, our chances are not, not nearly as good. I don't think she'll do it. But the Obamas, to a lesser extent, the Clintons, the other big people in the party, are they going to mobilize? And and I think one of the real dangers is if Sanders or Warren wins both Iowa and New Hampshire, which could easily happen, what is the what do the establishment people do then? Oof. If they try to stop them by rallying around Biden or Buttigieg or Bloomberg, it could backfire. Buttigieg is not establishment, though, is he? He seems mm-hmm. his policies he's, seem he's, pretty. He's he's kind of uh, tried to tried to play both sides, but I think now because particularly on the Signer is- issue of Medicare for all, mm. it's not for that. I think I think that uh, and given that he's raising money from from uh, from Wall Street and other right. places, I think the the left has decided he's not left. No, enough. they don't like him. So he's not gay enough you, either. You're exactly, <laughs> or for some people, he's too gay, but. Your view is correct on the merits that he is pretty far to the left, mm-hmm. but I don't think he's seen. I think I think if 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 Warren or Sanders looks like they're going to be a nominee, a lot of people in the party, if Buttigieg is, looks stronger than Biden at that point, a lot of people, including maybe Barack Obama and Michelle Obama, might rally around him because the establishment believes firmly that Warren and Sanders cannot win a general election. It's interesting. I I have a friend pretty high up in finance and she was saying that if the ele- if there's even wind that Sanders is going to get the election the the markets are going to tank. <laughs> right. And ironically of course that could hurt Trump because it would happen while he was while he was still president. Right. Warren I think has made a mistake and 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 a lot of people I talked to for the book said the same thing. If you're on the left while you're running you need to reach out to people on the center. If you're in the center you need to reach out to people on the left. She's done nothing as far as I can tell, to reach out to people. She, you know, she could she could go to Wall Street and give a speech and say, I don't agree with you on X, Y, and Z, right. but here's where we have common cause. Right. She could have private meetings like that. As best I can tell, she's done none of that. That means that if she's a nominee, she's not going to have a unified Democratic Party no. behind her. And I know people all over New York where I live who will not vote for Elizabeth Warren. They'll either vote for Trump or they won't vote. There, It's basically, I feel like if you're right of Bernie... You're essentially considered a conservative, or I'm. I'm not somebody that I come from the. Ver- my family's liberal, but you know, my dad likes Biden. It's mm-hmm. like that old school yeah. liberal, and he does not want Warren at all, yeah. and he's terrified of Sanders. <laughs> and, yeah. and so I got caught up kind of in the, all of this accidentally, and. I don't understand. I don't feel like anyone represents me. I don't feel like anyone on the extreme left or on the extreme right or even... Because they're not talking about the issues you care about? Because they're not... Because they're so extreme. They just... I I don't think anyone is talking about, particularly from the left, Mm -hmm. no one is saying... Essentially, if you even dare criticize the left, you are told that you're a Nazi or a white supremacist right. or you're carrying water for those people. So when I don't even know how the candidates can do that because they're trying to motivate these young voters, many of whom believe this ideology, and then they're trying to keep these moderate voters but you can't have it both ways. Well, a skillful politician can. You know, one of the but things I don't think I don't see of things, any of them one doing of the things this. I write about in the book, you know, the last person to beat an incumbent was Bill Clinton. Right. So I write a fair but amount he's in the Bill book Clinton. about him. Well, he is Bill Clinton, <laughs> but but you can look at what he did and I talked to a lot of the people who 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 worked for him in 92 and 96 and they said he he had these centrist positions in some areas, mm-hmm. but he also figured out a way to 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 make people on the left trust him. That's the challenge that that, as you said, is very difficult right now because if you cross the left now, you know Bill Clinton in 1992 
supported the death penalty. He supported right to work labor laws. He supported welfare reform. He supported free trade. Safe, legal, Those, and rare. On abortion. Those four positions were things that impossible to imagine anyone winning the Democratic nomination having. Right. But Clinton did because he was able to reassure the left. He would say, I'm a, de- I'm a Democrat by birth, instinct, and heritage. Right. And that reassured a lot of people. He had people who supported him from the far left of the party. You know, if Elizabeth Warren had one prominent centrist person supporting her, it'd be a huge deal. You know, why do you but, think centrist has become such a bad word or has it always been a bad word? And I just didn't know this. I mean, things have just become more polarized. Right. So just as just as centrist is now, you know, in the Republican Party is not acceptable. It's just all the incentives in our political and media systems are are to be towards the extremes. I also think social media has just created a an incredible opportunity for people on the left and on the right to to hold people accountable in a way that is absolute and even though members of Congress and presidential candidates rationally know that Twitter is not the real world, they act like it is. Right. And a lot of reporters act like it is. So you can you can you can go to a candidate and say, you know, you're being hammered for standing up to the left on this. And and, and the, the politician can say to the reporter, who's hammering me? And they'll say, well, look at these three tweets. Right. Not from prominent people on the left, just from randos on the left. But that's but that's enough for for liberal reporters, it's enough for liberal people on Twitter. And then you've got some prominent liberals on Twitter who will lead a crusade if somebody if somebody crosses them. They may get help get their chosen candidate elected president. They may also reelect Donald Trump. Oof. I think the only person, if she was old enough, who could go head to head with them is AOC. <laughs> Well, she certainly knows how to attract people. She, she does. She certainly is is tough, and and she understands. Uh, she's got a vision of America. She she's, understands social media too. She yeah. was raising money on Twitch, yeah. which yeah. is groundbreaking. Yeah. You know, she supports Sanders. And, yeah, and I think that I think that that's going to get greater prominence as we get head towards the voting because the 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 following she has and the symbolism of this young woman new to politics supporting Sanders, someone who's been in politics for a long time and in his 70s, I think it's going to be pretty powerful for him. But don't you think he's a little bit like Corbin in some respects, where he's got a lot of questionable supporters who are kind of known anti-Semites that are just lurking around in his sphere? I mean, anyone who runs for president is going to have some of that. Sanders Mm -hmm. certainly has his share. I think that I, I thought earlier in the year that he was the front runner. I really mm. thought he, he he had the strongest chance to win. His poll numbers have been lower than I thought they'd be. But I think now he really does have a chance to win both Iowa and New Hampshire. And if you win both of those, historically, you be you know you're unstoppable. So he might be able to beat Trump. Sanders. Yeah. What states could he win? Could he win Wisconsin? I mean, I feel like there are enough people who didn't vote for. Hillary out of spite who might come vote for him. You look at suburban women and you say to them, do you want to lose your health insurance? You say, to right. you, you say to union workers who work their whole careers to get this private health insurance coverage, you're losing this private right. health insurance coverage. I don't rule anything out. And I, and I don't want to say Sanders couldn't win, but there are a lot of reasons to believe. And a lot of Democrats I talked to for the book agree, it'd be very difficult to win if you're for yeah, I guess private it's, health insurance. I think it's only because he would rally the young people, but I don't know how many young people are in those states to rally. I mean, enough, but but you got to get suburban women too. You got to get union workers. Um, you got to get disaffected um, independents. I wonder and, about the suburban women too, just after the last four years. So many of them have been apologizing for their whiteness and they seem to have been kind of indoctrinated by a lot. It seems to be a lot of the millennials and then the like soccer moms right. that I see shaming people online uh. the most. In, in this respect and checking their privilege. And so I wonder how that will play out in the election. That seems to, you know, Chelsea Handler doing her documentary, there seems to be this. Well, one, one of the things I write about in the book, which I didn't know about before I did the reporting for the book, is there's, there are these groups of, of women, um, Indivisible and other groups, that started probably right after Trump got elected and you saw all the, the, the historic women's marches around mm-hmm, the country. Mm-hmm. A lot of these are older women. And they're very grassroots. They're very mm. local. They're very social media oriented. They stay in touch. In the midterms in 2018, I found when I talked to people who worked on the midterms, in races that Democrats won, a lot of the campaign managers said, we would get all these older women volunteers showing up. Uh, and we didn't, we didn't organize them. They just, they just showed up. They showed up through some of these groups. Uh, so 
can the Democratic nominee motivate these groups? If it's somebody like Sanders or Warren, I think that happens automatically. If it's somebody like Biden or Buttigieg, what the recommendation was for the people I talked to is we need to reach out to these people. We need to, as one person said, they need to self-publish. We don't want to tell them how to do their thing, but we want to empower them as much as possible. Right, right. I, I think if Trump loses those groups and, and, and the women you talked about, older women, women in their 40s, 50s, and 60s, who now have a way through these local organizations to play a role in voter registration and voter right. turnout and advocacy, that could be a big part of, of beating Trump that doesn't necessarily rely on the identity of the Democratic nominee. Right. It's so interesting. We live in such crazy, wild times. We do. And and Trump makes it crazy. Social media makes it crazy. And the, the real feud within the Democratic Party, the real the real divisions about what the party should stand for makes it crazy too. This is another area where I always feel so torn because, and I was talking to Megan Dom about this. She just came through yeah. and, and she's, you know, we're Gen X and we're, I, I said, am I just an old person? I mean, I'm young Gen X, but I was like, am I just screaming, like, get off my lawn while, you know, progress is happening and they'll look back and be like, oh, or am I holding the line against something that's corrosive to our, I mean, psych I feel like it's really bad for people psychologically, but also just our democracy, like the erosion of things like free speech and due process and the scientific method that I'm seeing on the left as well. I are deeply concerning to me. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're a clear thinking person, so you can see some of that on the left too. Most people on the left would say Trump's the only one doing that. And that creates this tribalism and, a, and a, an unwillingness to really think through what is this better American story? You know, was Barack Obama a successful president? We've seen in this, in this contest, we've seen some criticism from some of the Democrats, even though Barack Obama is personally still very popular. But what did Barack, how did Barack Obama fall short? And for a lot of Democrats, he fell short on health care. He fell short on the environment. He fell short on job creation. He fell short even on race relations. And they're looking for something more. Then you've got Democrats who say, really, that's about as good as we can do. Barack Obama is one of the best presidents we've ever had. That debate, just about that one person, crystallizes a lot of these questions mm. on the left that makes things very uncertain and makes it even harder to beat Trump. He was recently called an uh, a white conservative boomer for daring to criticize the left and saying that the finger wagging and the blaming is not, you're going to have to get over that and grow, basically grow up. Yeah. And I was, I've been joking for two years that they're going to cancel Obama because it seems like they're the, this is the other interesting thing about the left is that it is a circular firing squad. They end up eating themselves constantly. And I loved that quote you had, I'd never heard it. If I if the Democrats don't agree with each other, that's what make them make some Democrats. If if they agreed with each other, they'd be Republicans. Right. The Republicans they are good at circling the wagons and kind of certainly under Trump they've been. And there, there are times in the Republican Party's history where they haven't been. But but look, it's it's extraordinary, and and I see why Democrats are so frustrated, not just with impeachment, but in general, the Republican Party almost to a person has made at the elected officials and at the grassroots level, they've just made, they, they've made their terms with Trump. They've accepted the fact that he's going to do things they don't like, but they like the tax cuts, they like the mm -hmm. judges, and they don't want a Democrat to be elected president. So the Democratic Party is, is, is a circular firing squad. The fact that Barack Obama could say what he said and they'd go after him, I think, as you suggest, is, is kind of the most extreme illustration of their unwillingness to accept a diversity of thought within the party. And do you think of some of it comes from, I wonder too if it's just from that cognitive dissonance when you're faced with accepting reality or doubling down. I think people were so upset, obviously, that he was elected, but also that they weren't right. There's this sense of just bitterness that they could be so wrong. And I feel like they still haven't been able to get out of their own way enough to do any self-reflection to be able to, it's just easier to double down. Yeah, I mean, look, their aspirations are for a different America. And 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 some of them were disappointed about, about Barack Obama's America. And then much to their shock, they got Donald Trump as president. So <laughs> there's a lot of emotion involved with this. But, but the, the way they're conducting themselves now, 
like I said, I think it's going to, I think more likely to help Trump than hurt Always. him. And it is terrifying older leaders in the party with more experience and giving them less room to try to lead. Obama said something that almost no other elected Democrat would dare say. And he got hit for it. Imagine right. he's got the strength to, to withstand that. Imagine if someone else had said that, how much, how hard they'd be hit. They can't. I, that's what I mean. Even if Sanders wanted to criti- be critical of her own party, I don't think she could without being called a, yeah. a centrist or a Nazi or, or a sellout. Yeah. Or, yeah. It's, 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 it's an interesting time for the party with all this energy <laughs> and so much of it directed in a negative way at other, at other liberals, at other progressives. It's so cynical. I mean, there's cynicism on the right for sure. And I do think Trump paints this dark p- portrait of America, but there's a s- deeply cynical aspect of the Democratic Party right now that I just, I get so turned off when I hear them talking. It just sounds so cynical. Yeah, look. It is one of the early, most fundamental rules of presidential politics. I write about some in the book, which is optimism. Mm. The more optimistic candidate tends to win. A lot of these Democratic candidates are so twisted up by Trump, are so determined to run down the economy, to run down the trade deal with China, that they don't talk in a positive way. Right. And telling a better American story than Trump certainly involves telling a story that's at least as optimistic as Trump, and, and probably for most of them, they'd, they'd aspire to tell a more optimistic story than Trump. That's hard to do when there's so much anger in the party, and you, you, have to need, you need to find a way to talk about understanding why people are so angry and then pivoting to say, but things can be better. Right. It's a hard thing to do. And it's a lack of gratitude. So I don't, I don't know when there's so much entitlement. I feel like the entire, I read my, I talk about this all the time. I read my grandfather's letters from World War II and just the tone in which he writes is so different than the tone we live in because it's so whiny and complaining and so entitled and demanding. And I I feel like it's why I actually love Jonah Goldberg so much because he talks about this, how there's just a profound lack of gratitude overall in the culture. And yes, we can push for progress and say things need to change, but we don't need to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah. I mean, to me, the the phrase that that Senator McCain used all the time was to be part of something bigger than yourselves. Mm. I think a lot of young liberals think they want to be part of something bigger than themselves. But the way they conduct themselves in their daily lives often is, as you said, more self-involved, more more with a sense of entitlement, rather than, as your grandfather and, and that generation did, think about the greater good, the public good, and and sacrifice in your local community, within your family, in the national interest to try to to try to to try to change things. It's hard because things are so polarized. Right. So we say, I want to be part of something bigger than myself, but I don't want anyone who supports Donald Trump to be part of that bigger thing. Right. I do. I don't I have, have to. I mean, almost half the country supported him last time. Yeah. Almost half the country supports him now. It, it just it doesn't make any sense to aspire to be in a country. But as you said, I mean, the number of friendships that have ended over Donald Trump being president, it's incalculable. It is. I talked to my therapist about it a lot, a lot of marriages too. She said it's definitely caused a huge rift in yeah. families. And it's just one of those, I don't know, I feel, I, I'm very grateful that I, I was in, this is a piece I'm writing actually for Spectator, just how being in recovery helped me so much at, during the election. And I felt like I can't, I don't have the luxury of being in resentment and anger for years because I'll drink over it or do drugs or something. So I don't have, so I have to very quickly come into acceptance, accept what is, and also recognize that, you know, the very baseline, one of the things they repeat all the time in 12 step is principles before personality. And so we are all trying to recover. And I see America as a bit of a hitting a little bit of a rock bottom together as a culture. And I see us all as trying to recover. And we have to put aside those personalities and focus on what are the basic principles and values. But I see two Americas. When I look at Twitter and I follow people on the right and people on the left and everyone and and intermingle with them because I don't believe in all the guilt by association stuff, it almost seems like there's two completely set different set of values that are at play. And I'm not sure how you bridge that division. Yeah. I mean, because of the experiences you've had, 
you are able to do two things that a lot of people on Twitter cannot do. And a lot of people in our society can't do, and Trump has exacerbated this. You, you have the ability to demonstrate humility, and you have the ability to demonstrate acceptance. Uh, and people who've gone through problems with drugs or other addictions, and it successfully conquered them or controlled them, they learn those two things. Mm-hmm. I've learned those two things a lot more in the last couple of years than I, than I had them before. But if you go on Twitter and you read angry tirades at people from the left and from the right, you see, again, a lack of humility and a lack of acceptance. And it is, it is what it is doing, you know, talked about the incalculable uh, number of broken relationships, the incalculable impact this has on the mental health of people. I don't like a lot of what Donald Trump does. No. I think in some ways he's literally the worst person who could be president of the United States. But I don't let him get me angry. No. It's not, it's just not worth it. What's he, the point? It doesn't, it doesn't help. Try to under, <laughs> try like... to be understanding. And 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 if not of Trump himself, of his supporters. But we need to start a 12-step for America. Exactly. You know, it's like I say to my friends who are so torn up in this, and and these are rich white people in LA. Right. I'm like, how is this affecting your actual daily right. life? The man's 3,000 miles away. And by the way, it's fine. I mean, some of my friends on the Upper East Side writing these insane things on Twitter all day, raging. I'm like, you're, you're hot. Like, you, none of this is affecting you other than maybe your portfolio went up. Nothing about this. And it's good for you to fight for people who can't fight. And there are marginalized people who are being affected by any presidency. Doesn't matter which one. And we need to give voice to those people and that's okay to fight for, but you don't, the amount of time and anger and rage, I'm like that idea of, I always ask my therapist how, you know, they always say in therapy, don't let this person live in your brain rent free. Right. And I mean, Trump is the, he is the supreme landlord of America right (laughs) now because he has every, he's living in everyone's brain. Yeah, and, and, and the, the anger just doesn't help. It no. does not help. But, but you know, I mean, I'm not the first person to ask this question, but where was all this anger before people could express it on Twitter? Mm. Where did it go? How did how did people how did did people not have it, or did they have it and they they bottled it up, or did they just yell at the person next to them? Because because again, I don't know how you quantify this, but the number of angry tweets about Donald Trump or anyone at guilt by association, as you said, associated with Donald Trump, just the, if you could measure venom mm-hmm. somehow, if you could quantify me- venom just on Twitter, forget other forms of expression, forget cable TV, et cetera. Just the amount of negative anger is, is, it's incalculable and it's not healthy. And, and it's people who haven't had the experiences you've had they cannot show humility and they cannot show acceptance. Even today, they were going after J.K. Rowling for being a TERF and then TERFs was trending the trans exclusionary radical feminists and I get called this all the time just for saying, you know, boys and girls are different and the amount of venom, just fuck TERFs, fuck TERFs, TERFs are garbage. Everybody can, every TERF can go fucking die and I was saying this, uh, yesterday or a couple days ago the the big difference that i notice is that on the right they'll they'll th- death threat you like my experience with the right is mm-hmm. that and on the left they'll say you should just go kill yourself right so it's this <laughs> weird different they're interested tactic. in the same result but, it's the but same thing yeah. they want you to die yeah. they're just more passive aggressive I mean, about let, it let, let's double back and 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 give credit where credit's due we have seen a liberalization of our society, uh, n- nowhere near far enough, but a greater acceptance of gay and lesbian Americans and people. So fast. So fast. It's crazy. We've seen an understanding that 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 privilege needs to be uh, unpacked. It needs to be, uh, if not eradicated, it needs to be understood and it needs to be equalized more. There's, there's a, a tremendous uh, progress that's being made intellectually and society lots more needs to be made but the people who want to see that the most often are undermining their own cause right. not by being accommodationist not for fighting for what they believe in but by going about it not the way Gandhi or Martin Luther King would but with an anger right. that that is that is it's just counterproductive it's unhealthy and it and it's dividing people rather than bringing people together and it's going to make it harder to be Donald Trump because because people will be unhappy with the democratic nominee there just all, will be within the Democratic Party, no matter who it is. No matter who it is. All all of the, the people you mentioned, too, who they had faith. You know, there was a certain amount of faith, and that feels so lacking in 
our culture just in general. And I understand why I understand people have had been traumatized by their religions and religion has come under fire. And, but I don't know how you really inspire people without inspiring them with some sense of meaning greater than themselves. And that's what worries to me. I, that's, it worries me just, it feels like there's a just, genuine lack of leadership yeah well look trump has donald trump has hurt us on that cause mm. having this extraordinarily loyal support from people who say they're religious conservatives oh, yeah. given his personal conduct that's a problem but i think within the democratic party there's a there's a, a, a an unwillingness for a lot of these candidates to talk about faith because they don't want to offend people who don't who don't support organized religion and i agree with you it's a crisis in this country because you cannot have a functioning society of any sort including especially democracy without people having a belief in a higher good belief in meaning belief in um in working together and again i go back to those two words humility and acceptance mm -hmm. there's so little of that and i i have people who i have known for years who are people of faith by by their by their the way they live their lives and the way they they talk who will attack me on twitter in in personal terms mm -hmm. and then when i see them they'll act like nothing happened mm. and that's a hard thing for me to that's reconcile weird. it's a hard thing for me to reconcile that anyone would do that but particularly someone of faith yeah and that and that's part of the danger of social media and the and the impact it has on on lots of people of all types so you were saying that you've had to experience some humility and acceptance this whole podcast is about grit and resilience in general what has been your experience and how how do you think you've come out on the other side? A uh, little over two years ago, there were a series of stories about my uh, horrible conduct when I worked at ABC News mm -hmm. now 13 years ago. Um, I treated a lot of people who worked at ABC and, and the junior junior people uh, in, a, in a way that was unacceptable. I sexually harassed them, and I I behaved in a way that took away their, their liberty, that took away, uh, in many cases, their feelings of, of confidence and, and, and the ability to be comfortable and thrive in the workplace. I was very sorry for it at the time. I left ABC and went and got five and a half years of therapy. This was now, uh, you know, 10 years ago. And I stopped. I, I went on to work in other places and changed my behavior. When uh, the Me Too movement began in earnest and the stories appeared, there were stories about my past conduct. Some of the things that were said about me were absolutely true, and I took responsibility for them. Some were not. Um, and, and because there was no investigation by ABC or any of the people who employed me at the time, I... I was put in a position where I could try to be really specific about what was true and what was not. Mm -hmm. And I was initially, but I thought that the more important thing was to take responsibility for what I did, mm -hmm. to apologize both publicly and privately to people uh, I'd hurt and, and people who were willing to meet with me. And in the process, I've had to learn about friendship, about um, about loyalty, about how to, how to find my way in the world without most of the people and institutions that were made up my professional and much of my personal life before. And I've had to learn to uh, deal with a lot of the traits, including tra narcissism that um, drove me to behave the way I did. And even when I stopped sexually harassing people in the workplace, I still behaved in a narcissistic way. Mm -hmm. And so I have oh, over, over the last couple of years, I've learned to believe what people told me in the beginning, which I didn't believe in the beginning, which is, not only can I use this opportunity to to build a better life for myself and to be a better person, but I, but but I must and I will and and I think I'm on the path to doing that. Do you think that there's um the connection between a lack of faith and a lack of redemption in our culture right now is? Do you think those things are connected? I think that is in some cases. Um, you know, again, the left is is and. I'm glad they are champions of second chances for people who commit murder, who commit other other serious crimes. Um, but they're less forgiving in a lot of cases of people who've committed acts of sexual harassment. Mm -hmm. They've they've marked that that bad behavior as as somehow more irredeemable than than they feel about other things. So I think I think there are certainly people of faith who who aren't in a in a mood right now or or don't feel that certain people should be forgiven. Mm -hmm. I think 
Um, and I've tried to be part of this conversation, but because, because of my standing in the world, I haven't really been given much of an opportunity to do it. But I think that it's, we're, we're past the point where people should be saying, what's the right answer for people who have made mistakes and atoned or who want to atone and want to be part of a discussion. I think we need to move on to actually at letting that happen right. because too many people, not just people caught up in the me too movement because of their past bad behavior, but too many people for, for other infractions are, are, um, canceled and, uh, and moved out of their life. And there, this, the society overall, I think there are people who are forgiving, but they are afraid to speak up right. because the loudest people and the people who are the most threatening to employers, to corporations, uh, to communities are the people who say no forgiveness, uh, maybe someday, but without any specificity about what that would entail. Yeah. I don't know. I just feel like if I had never been forgiven for all my shit ass behavior when I was on drugs and alcohol, I it would be much it would have I maybe still would have recovered, but it it is the forgiveness of my family and friends and and people and society and just I've seen miracles in those rooms. People who have come in and you're like, "Ah, that person's not staying sober and then turn their life around and now they have years Mm. and their family back. And so I just, I believe in the power of redemption and I love the redemptive, the redemption, redemption stories and that arc. And I think that it's maybe the most powerful story that we can tell in, in our society. One of the, we all fail, you know, I just, I mean, I, 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 I want to take responsibility for what I did. I absolutely must. It's essential. But at the same time, I want to, I want to understand how I can be part of society. And I want people to feel like it's possible for, for to forgive me if, if they're willing to do it. And also to forgive myself. Right. I think one of the, one of the hardest things for me over the last two years is how do you take responsibility for doing really bad things to other people, no matter how long ago it was or how recently it was? And forgive yourself and not and not beat yourself up, particularly because my actions had an impact on my family, it had an impact on my friends, had an impact on my on my employers and colleagues. So I think I think what makes it more difficult is social media. Right. It is the relentless criticism of anyone who 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 is is caught doing something wrong. It makes it very hard. And um and and I just think for for the sake of society, for the sake of mental health, and for the sake of of living living in a, in a country that believes that we shouldn't be judged by our worst moments, right? In, in the totality of of who we are, I think things have to change. I want to take responsibility for what I did, but I don't want what I did to define me for the rest of my life. Right. I I really understand <clears throat> this. Well, I have two questions that I ask sure. everyone at the end. What is your biggest defect of character or vice that you're either working on or worked on or however you interpret that? Narcissism. Okay. <laughs> and how and do all you, the things how that do you work that. against that? Um, you think about uh, how to behave. You change your behavior. Right. Uh, if you change your behavior, that starts to change what's inside right. of you. And so most fundamentally, program too. most fundamentally is narcissists care about themselves above above other people. Now, I've been blessed and helped by the fact that I have a son who turns three uh, in early t- 2020. Wow. And being responsible for him and caring about him. I mean, I think I think every parent goes through some of that because all, so many things that you thought were essential in your life now are 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 minimized or no part of your life at all. Um, so that's one one way is to is to think about my son, and the other is to just in every instance, in every social interaction with people, big and small, family, friends, strangers, is to think about things from their point of view, mm. not just think about them from my point of view. Mm-hmm. I've got a long way to go, but I know that I have traveled, particularly in the last year. A great distance, and and uh, to the extent I'm given a chance to be part of any group or society again, I know I will handle things differently than mm-hmm. I used to. Even just putting yourself out there and writing a book must have been so challenging. 
Yeah, you know, I didn't. I didn't want to go back to journalism mm-hmm. um, because because I felt it was more pr- important for me to not be out there in the face of the, the people who were my victims, uh, the women I the women I victimized, and also I thought a quieter life was better for me and my family. But Judith Regan, my publisher, asked me if I would write a book, and at the time I had no other professional prospects at all. Mm-hmm. So I and I was really interested in this topic, and I thought it was an important topic. But yeah, it was it, it definitely definitely a mixed experience. Some of the negative reaction was yeah. very hurtful. But um, but I do I do know that part of what my life needs to be about is is working and being busy and trying to make a contribution. And the book was part of that. Judith seems amazing. She's an incredible person. I, I I've I've followed her career for a long time. She's one of the most successful people in the history of publishing. But she's really one of the toughest people I've ever met and fearless <laughs> and willing to stand with me publicly uh, when very few people have been willing to do that in yeah. the last couple of years. And what's your greatest asset? Uh, my greatest asset as a person or professionally, or I have to decide. I mean, as a person. Um, I think my greatest asset is that I'm extraordinarily curious and I, I'm curious from just intellectually curious, but, but I find that I can often help people by giving them advice about how they might tackle a personal or professional problem because my curiosity has allowed me to, to develop, uh, at the age of almost 55, uh, just kind of a huge warehouse of, of human intelligence mm. and understanding of the right way to address problems. Uh, and I'm usually pretty, I'm usually better at figuring out how other people should address their problems than I am at addressing my own. <laughs> Aren't we all? Well, thank you so much. Where can we find you? And I I want everyone to get your book. The best thing, even if you love Trump, the best, I, I loved reading this book. There's so much history of all of the other campaigns which I found so interesting. Yeah. It's, it's just fascinating. It's got to some me. history. It's got this, these interviews with these Democratic strategists and kind of and kind of synthesized. So if you're a Democrat who's looking to figure out who to vote for, I think it's a good book for you. If you're interested in in in, in understanding Donald Trump and why he's so formidable as a as a politician, I think that's of interest. And again, it's not an anti-Trump book. It's not a pro-Trump book. It simply describes why Trump is so formidable and what the smartest Democrats I've met in the last 30 years think needs to be done to beat him. That's what I love about it. It's not, it doesn't feel venomous. It's just, it feels very compassionate and and clear. eyed There are things in it that the president would love. There are things in it that the president will not love. Yeah. It's, it's just, I've, I've, I've had, I've had the privilege of covering a lot of presidential campaigns and candidates. I've, I think I have a pretty good understanding of him. Uh, and I think I think not enough has been written about explaining uh, both him and his ties with the people who support him. And I hope I've contributed to that. Well, and so where can we find you on social media? Um, so you can- know, <laughs> I'm on I'm on Twitter and I'm on Facebook and I'm on Instagram, although my Instagram accounts mostly my pictures of my son. <laughs> um, I've kind of cut back on social media. I was doing a newsletter for a while. I've, I've suspended that for a while. I've got some projects in the work. So for now, if people want to find me, the best thing to do is to buy my book. Okay. Um, and, uh, and stay tuned and hopefully I'll be, I'll be doing something else, maybe in the public realm, maybe not. But for now, uh, the book is my, is my major public facing uh, project. Okay. Well, thank you for joining You're us. You're nice to host me. I really appreciate it. <laughs> it's time for the weekly check-in with Bridget and cousin Maggie. Hello, Bridget. Hello, Maggie. This is me from off of Twitter. Coming to I'm you live. speaking to you from beyond the Twitter grave. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's been so great. I, the last few times I've called you, I've been like, what are you doing? You're like writing. I was like, wow, it's been so long since I've heard that response from you. Because I have nothing else to do <laughs> now that I can't tweet. <laughs> Life is a meaningless void. Life is a meaningless void where I'm screaming into it. Without from my computer. Without Twitter. With no feedback. It's just me screaming. A silent scream. Is there anyone alive out there? <laughs> it's so funny because I go through the same process. I pretty much know now because I've done this. This is the third time I think I've yeah, gone off Twitter. Yeah, third year in a row. Is it third yeah, year in a row? I think so. And I know now exactly how I feel like day, like day three, I always have a breakdown. You, do. <laughs> you always go to a real dark place day three. <laughs> day three, I'm like, luckily day three this year fell on my day that I had therapy, thank God. And by the end of the therapy session, I'm like, I don't know what's wrong with me. And then I was like, oh, it's day three of qu- quitting Twitter. And she's like, oh, <laughs> 
like, I wish I had known that at the beginning of this therapy <laughs> session. She's like, is it your hormones? Like, she, she couldn't try and figure out what was wrong with me. And then she was like, oh, right. We've been through this before. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> Day three of quitting anything and you're a mess. But it does do such a good job of hiding. I mean, so many things. Wow. It's obviously an escape. Right. From emotions, like any addiction. And it's also... What I'm seeing more clearly this time than I didn't see last time, probably because the shock of being off Twitter was so great, what is the how calm everything feels? If I didn't have any financial insecurity, like how because it's so much of my marketing tool and driving people to help support like the podcast and dumpster fire and all of this thing right. so that we don't have to sell out. I get financial insecurity, but had I, if I didn't have that, it would be like a blissful, calm time of quiet because there's so much chaos and fight there. And I get such adrenaline from even just observing it. Yep. And it makes things seem much more chaotic than they are. And yep. this week I'm like, everything's so calm and quiet. Like, I don't really have that much to, you know, like... What's going on? I don't know. It's it's weird. Yeah. The whole whole world seems to calm down. And then even last night watching Super Tuesday as like a normie, I, I would say, yeah. was very strange. Not weighing in. With you know, your... I wanted to text Jake Tapper and be like, are you okay? You look exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> like, like DM him. <laughs> and it's that's weird realizing how when you're in the trenches even if you're just a normal you know person like me or you or many people who are kind of addicted to twitter you still are it's almost like being behind the scenes at the at the play it's true you yeah. see all the like chaos and all the interfighting and apparently warren's you know some of warren's people were fighting on twitter last night and started trading barbs publicly and there were there was all kinds of you just don't see any of that right. drama. No, not I don't, I'm clueless about it unless I hear it from you. And all the journalists piling on each other from different uh, you know sides of the aisle and Maddow going after Sean King because he said something and and so and you probably wouldn't even know who Sean King is if you weren't on Twitter. It's nope. he's an activist. So yeah, it's just been it's been a strange That was weird to watch it. Just and it makes me realize how cynical being on Twitter and seeing all of that makes me feel about media and politics in general. Yeah. Because just watching, I gen I generally switch between the three channels, the three major cable news media stations when I'm watching something like Super Tuesday to get the vibe of all of them. Mm -hmm. And I usually end on CNN, and I was saying this in a little thing I wrote on com today. Just that it just, I live in a city. It just looks the most like my experience of America. Uh -huh. It's very, it's the most diverse, I would say, like their panels. And Fox is, is very much like lots of white people. And, and I was saying, you know, like women with crosses. And like, I, not that I have anything against white people or women with crosses. I just, that's not my experience of the country. Right. It just, and so it's like, how I feel more unnerved usually when I'm in suburbia right, or rural America, I get really creeped out because I'm just used to cities. Mm -hmm. And people from the country come to cities and they're like, how the fuck do you deal with this? Mm -hmm. Like all this noise and traffic and people everywhere and begging and all of it. And I'm just used to all of it. Mm -hmm. So CNN feels a lot more like the begging, <laughs> chaotic experience of a city. But that's weird too, just seeing all the differences and then and then just how quickly all of it starts feeling like propaganda. Yeah. Because you're not seeing behind the scenes, you're just seeing the show. The, yeah. The facade. The flash. Yeah. And it all starts to look like flashy prop propaganda no matter which channel you're on. Yeah. And it all starts to sound like state media, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. And even last night on on CNN, it's like they barely mentioned Bernie. You're like, okay, clearly you guys are all in for Biden and mm -hmm. the establishment. Mm -hmm. And you could see that. But if you were just, you know, a normal CNN viewer, you wouldn't see that. No. 
you'd be like, oh, Biden. Okay, Biden. You yeah. know, you'd just be like, I'm on board with Biden now. You've peeked behind the curtain. You know too much. I know too much. <laughs> but it's Twitter. Anyone yeah. on Twitter knows too much. Yep. So there was definitely a sense of FOMO that I hadn't really had. Because usually after day three of my nervous mental breakdown and emotional breakdown, days four and five, I usually feel pretty good about being off. Mm -hmm. And I start spending more time and I'm more present and I'm purging my closets and you have like all these free hours. Yep. And yeah, then you've been very productive. I have been. This period of time. But again, I also know that this is, as we call it in 12-step or getting sober, the pink cloud. Hmm. I was like, oh, I can do this. And then I'm like, oh, man, I'm not even 10 days in of 40. <laughs> it's so long. You know what can happen? You know long 40 days is in the, in the news cycle? I'm going to be an irrelevant nobody by the time I go back on. Nah, you got dumpster fire. But it's also hard to do dumpster fire. Because I'm not in the dumpster. Oh, that's true. Or the fire. But still. Or, or causing fires <laughs> in the dumpster. Like stealing memes. It's just hard. It's all, that makes that more difficult because I'm not so. Yeah. Not and I'm so just in not touch. in such a snarky mood. Yep. Yep. It, it's, it's good that you do this every year, I think. It shows you a lot. You always seem to come have some sort of perspective on it. Hi, An epiphany I immediately forget. Uh-huh. It's amazing how that happens, right? I've talked to my life coach about this. I'm like, literally, like, I can have the most insightful, amazing breakthrough insight into my own mind and, and then and even writing it down. And then I will block it out. I will yeah. block it out from my mind and my memory. I will completely <laughs> forget it because I don't want to have to look at it or change it or whatever is a life coach just a therapy with therapist without a degree kind of but it's different at least the one i'm working with is different because i was thinking i've been thinking about this a lot lately i'm like i there's a lot of kind of therapy going on i guess but it's for me there's a much more like spiritual aspect to it yeah. and there's a lot of like soul work and like just th which i really find helpful woo. Um, yeah there's a lot of woo and <laughs> and i like that element to it a lot it's something it's you don't get the woo with traditional therapy i no, mean you kind you can't. of right i mean unless you went to like they'd get it's too much pseudoscience right and and for me it's just it's you're like bring it up bring all the yeah, pseudoscience it speaks, to, it speaks i i need it yeah i i find it very satisfactory and and get a lot out of it so, yeah um because i don't have you know i'm not i don't have a like religion i subscribe to and i don't have that like peace, but I am also a spiritual person. So it, it helps me practice kind of my spirituality in a, in a regular fashion rather than like going to church or something yeah. like that. So that makes I, sense. I've really kind of been digging into that and realizing that lately. That was that whole piece I did on even astrology was how modern young people don't have religion. So more people are turning to things like astrology for that kind of looking for meaning and looking for explaining things you mm -hmm. know that maybe aren't explainable it's really interesting coming on the heels of talking to somebody like michael Shermer, who's such a skeptic mm -hmm. and i we were talking on the podcast which will be coming soon for our listeners ish uh the first week in april we'll drop it he we were talking about how you know i'm like i just like believing in reincarnation mm -hmm. <laughs> And until you can prove to me that it's not true, I'm going to believe it. Right, it's much more interesting. Yeah, and it's hard, it's hard to argue that, but from a science perspective, that's just blasphemy. Right. Well, I mean, you just made me think of something and now I can't remember what it was, but oh, no, I think too what it's done for me is it's given me a lot more confidence in my own intuition, mm. my own like... I, I understand there's a lot to it and that I, I, I'm i very good at, if I'm honest with myself and I've gotten much better about being honest with myself, I am very good at finding where that's coming from, where whatever it is is coming from, what's going on and, and, and even applying it to kind of external situations now where I'm like, I have an insight into this and I trust myself, I trust my intuition on that and, and it, it just is, it's helpful. Yeah. 
Intuition is weird. I, again, had a long conversation with Peter Bogosian and guys like Michael Shermer, and they're like, it's bullshit, mm. essentially. <laughs> Which It's just pattern recognition. And it, maybe it is, yeah. but uh, that's okay. If yeah. it's showing up for me as intuition and it's I'm absorbing a thousand details and recognizing some sort of pattern, fine. Yeah. I don't care what the scientific definition of it is. I or- laugh in the face of all of these scientists because I've had so much witchy, weird stuff happen oh, to me. Oh, yeah. Oh, shoot. I forgot to ask Michael, too, how to explain how he would explain my weird earthquake um, psychicness the other day that happened. Oh. When I asked a friend if they had a flashlight and they were like, that's weird. Why? Yeah, I have one. And then I was like, next to your bed in case of an earthquake. And they're like, yeah. And then there was an earthquake three minutes later. And my friend is like a huge skeptic. And they were like, okay, that was weird. That was, yeah. that is weird. <laughs> it's not like I ask that question every night. No. It's just I had a weird you know, Spidey sense. Right. And then three minutes later, it was like a very strange. The more you pay attention to that stuff, the more you realize how it's like, it's like exercising a muscle. The more you flex it, the more you are like, oh, this does happen a lot. This, and you and I have ha- have that a lot all it's the time. It's just, again, the skeptics. Yeah. I'm good at making their arguments now. will say you only remember the hits. So we don't yeah. remember the times we predicted an earthquake and then it didn't happen. But when I never predict an earthquake. No, that's me not neither. not something I ever do. Well, that's why it was weird because my friend, the skeptic, was saying, if you did this all the time, it would just be, you know, lots of numbers. And then, you know, there's a chance of that happening eventually if you're constantly doing that. But because I've never done it before, it was just right. weird. Well, it's just like I was waiting in line to vote yesterday and my f- saw my friend walking down the street, my friend Emily, and I hadn't seen her in a while. She, uh, she and I went to high school together back on the East Coast and we reconnected. We both live in Santa Monica. And I was like, hey. And we started talking. She was like, God, you, I've been meaning to get in touch with you. I, you just popped into my head last week. And I was like, same for me. Like I was thinking about, she popped in my head last week and I was like, you have to, I was like, I have to reach out to Emily. And then there she was. This goes back to the, it's Justin Timberlake thinking about me t-shirt. <laughs> exactly. But it's just re- literally like we, uh, whether I was thinking of her or she was thinking of me or we were both thinking of each other and we popped into each other's heads. Like it's that, that's energy. That's yeah. an energy exchange that we're, we, came up for each other and I was yeah. like I've got to reach out to her she was like same for, she was like we're just oh we my thought about best each friend other. and I have had this for yeah. ever since he, we were children I know and you and I it's always like you'll I'll be reaching for my phone to call you and you call me it's just I used to keep a you know a journal kind of of those things right. when I was thinking of people and then check with the person if they were thinking of me and I've always wanted to start a website where you could actually figure that out uh-huh where you can keep track of who you thought of at the particular time or day. Or if you could just at them. Mm-hmm. You know, if everybody was on this database and you're like at that person uh-huh. and somehow figure out if they're thinking of you at that moment, <laughs> it would be weird. I mean, I guess we could do it with social media, but I don't know that. I don't know if we talked about the Justin Timberlake We did here. on Dumpster Fire. Yeah. Now. Bridget for there was one period of time like what a year or two ago that you were like for a week you were like obsessively thinking about Justin he just kept, I kept thinking about him all the time <laughs> and then I said to Maggie I was like is Justin Timberlake thinking about me because <laughs> we have these conversations about how whenever somebody the this idea of energy exchange it was just really funny. and it was it's gonna be a t-shirt. It's gonna be a fantasy it made t-shirt me crack for up sure. For it makes it makes <laughs> me die laughing. I just want to wear that t-shirt. <laughs> just like walking around with a t-shirt, <laughs> like is Justin Timberlake thinking about me? <laughs> and then I was like, you never know. <laughs> he might be. He might have come across you randomly somehow on the internet, and you were you stuck in his brain for a minute there. <laughs> There's yeah. nothing that says that hasn't happened. <laughs> Justin Timberlake. Unless you can refute this. <laughs> we're taking it. <laughs> Justin Timberlake might be listening. Maybe maybe he's a secret fan. Maybe he's a huge fan. And now he'll reach out and be like, yes, yes, I was thinking about you. 
And then we can be like, confirmed. My psychic powers never fail. <laughs> they never fail. Yep. Just Justin Timberlake mm. thinking about me. <laughs> that was like for a week. It was the refrain. You were like, but more importantly, <laughs> is Justin Timberlake thinking about me? <laughs> Anytime anyone texts me because someone died in, in LA or not LA, California for the, from the coronavirus. And they're like, are you okay? And all, all week now, I'm just going to be like, um, they'll be like, be careful out there. I'm like, you guys don't, I pretty much live like I'm quarantined already, <laughs> so don't worry. But more importantly, is Justin Timberlake <laughs> like, thinking about me? It should be like your sign off and all your emails. <laughs> <laughs> just like your auto signature. <laughs> yeah. But more importantly, <laughs> is Justin Timberlake like, thinking about me? <laughs> I'm gonna will that shit into existence. <laughs> What's the ears, Bo? Is it time? She's really desperate for attention. Yeah, and walking. Shocking. A All dog right. desperate for attention. You should take this little monster. I know it's time. She knows it's right, right on the nose. Mm -hmm. All right, 4 p.m. Well, it's time to wrap this up. What do you have to say to the people? I don't know. I hope everyone's doing well out there. And email us at any one of my various email accounts that I check <laughs> sporadically. Like 20. And now they should all have the <laughs> sign off. Is Justin Timberlake thinking about me? He might be. Maggie ended that one <laughs> kind of short. <laughs> A little prematurely. Yeah, they're like 20 email addresses. Go find, Good luck finding them. <laughs> they're not anywhere publicly because we like to make... Everything as hard as possible here at Fantasy <laughs> Inc. <laughs> There's no consistent. People always email me. They're like, do you know how hard it is to find an email address for you? <laughs> Good. That's just the way we like it. But if you do want to find me, Justin Timberlake, you can email me at I am politically homeless at Gmail or Walkins welcome questions at gmail or weekly dumpster fire at, at gmail. gmail any one of those three will eventually get looked at it might be mom maybe <laughs> the best way is to just dm her on twitter but then she's gone for lunch so <laughs> give it another 30 days smoke signals justin timberlake we know you're desperate to reach out <laughs> <laughs> i'd like to thank our sponsor mm lafleur M.M. Lafleur is a wardrobe solution for professional women. It creates luxury apparel and accessories with the same attention to detail as high-end fashion houses. Right now, if you visit mmlafleur.com slash walkin and use promo code walkin, you'll get 15% off your first purchase. That's M-M-L-A-F-L-E-U-R dot com slash walk in and you can get 15% off your first purchase with promo code walk in tune in next week for another riveting episode that will change your life help you get out of your own way and solve all the world's problems I want to thank Ricochet our composer Jared Elias my co-producer and cousin Maggie and all of you out there listening this has been walk in's welcome with Bridget Phetasy I'm Bridget Phetasy and you're welcome <laughs> <laughs> it's the dumbest line. <laughs>